Thanks for everybody for coming. It's such a beautiful day, so I appreciate the attendance. Uh, this is the Big Data Madison meetup, so hopefully you guys are in the right place. Uh, plenty of food and drinks left available, so I'd like to thank uh, Cloudera. Specifically, Cloudera is sponsoring the food. They're a longtime sponsor of the meetup. I don't think anybody's here from Cloudera, but I'd like to thank them anyway. Um, after the meetup, there is going to be a sponsored round of drinks. Their sponsor is Hortonworks. And I don't see anyone from Hortonworks here, which I guess means I'm picking up the tab. <laughs> but uh, that's over at the Ivory Room, which is literally like half a block up on Mifflin. So if you guys want to go grab a sponsored round of drinks and do a little bit of uh, chit chat and networking, Ben's going to be there, right, Ben? I will. Ben will be there. So uh, we'll just head over right after the meetup. And uh, if, you just, if you want to go, just hang out for a couple minutes and then we'll head right over. A uh, couple of announcements. A uh, couple of announcements. Um, so I'll send something out much more about this later, but me and some other folks have been trying to work towards uh, doing a Wisconsin Big Data Conference. Um, and we haven't sent anything out officially about this yet, but the date is going to be on Monday, August 22nd. It's part of the Forward Tech Fest, which is a big sort of week-long technical event here in Madison. Uh, we're doing a half-day event trying to get a bunch of speakers, um, get a sponsor so no one has to pay to come. It's actually going to be here, and they're going to take down the dividers. So it's going to be in the next room as well. Um, so like I said, I don't have a ton of information about it yet, but I'm working hard to kind of get the logistics together, get speakers, um, and get a really interesting and good uh, conversation going. Uh, so that'll be hopefully great. So we'll see what happens with that. But, um, otherwise, I'd like to introduce Ben Carpenter. Uh, ben Carpenter is going to be talking uh, about Mongo, or as the case may be, DB up there. Uh, I've been looking for a Mongo uh, presenter for a very long time because it's a very popular NoSQL database, and I've had zero luck getting it, and then Ben and I actually worked together, so that just sort of fell into my lap. Anyway, here you go, Ben. Thank you. All right. So, um, before we get going, just a little, uh, little context. On my background, uh, I'm a native Oklahoman, uh, <laughs> University of Oklahoma alumni, graduated computer engineering there, uh, and then got recruited to Wisconsin from a little uh, Verona-based health startup, um, <laughs> and I worked there for a little over nine years before moving over to more uh, sort of web application-focused development. And so in the last two years or so, probably been working on apps that are based on Mongo for about 18 months or so of that uh, on a couple of different projects. So I guess before we get started, how many people have actually used Mongo before? So I know. All right. Looks like almost half. So hopefully, uh, you know, if I say anything wrong, let me know. Be nice. Uh, and uh, so a few basics. Um, it took me a really long time to hear Mongo and not think about Blazing Saddles, so I had to include that. Um, but as Pete said, uh, MongoDB is a very popular NoSQL database, um, and often you, know, you hear about sort of SQL versus NoSQL things. Um, it's important to keep in mind that NoSQL isn't really a type of database so much, it's just kind of a broad category of a bunch of different <coughs> databases. Uh, and those kind of break down into four big categories. Uh, so a couple of the simpler ones, key value model and wide column model. Um, these are pretty basic and uh, basically give you a lot of speed because there's not a whole lot of other things going on in the mix. Uh, you're pretty limited in how you can query them, but you need to store some data in a pretty simple format, and you need to access it really fast. These are some good options. Uh, as it says, the key value model is used by Redis. The wide column model uh, is what Cassandra uses. Then there's also graph model, uh, which is used by uh, Neo4j, uh, which basically is really good at doing sort of looking at the relationships between different objects. Um, and finally, we have the document model. So this is where MongoDB fits in. Uh, so a document model stores these sort of amorphous JSON-like objects that you can put data in more or less in any format you want. 
more complex data types than you could in some of those earlier uh, types that we talked about. So you can do arrays and you can do embedded objects and, um, and so this is the kind of thing we're going to talk about. And so when you're looking at am I going to use SQL or am I going to use one of these others, I won't dwell on this too much, but these are a couple of the key factors that you might want to look at. Um, so flexibility, you know, what does your data really look like? Is it very strongly structured or is it sort of a more, uh, more of a moving target? Uh, maybe you don't know your requirements right up front, but you want to start coding something that's often billed as one of the times that uh, Mongo is a good choice because it does have a lot of flexibility in letting you store different kinds of data in the same collection. So if your model evolves over time, it's not going to blow up your database. On the other hand, you might want a whole lot of structure, in which case um, you can kind of do that with Mongo still if you want to, but it's more native to things like SQL. Uh, scaling is another place where you often hear a big uh, plus for Mongo. It was basically designed to be scalable, um, and later on in the talk we'll get into a little more of how it handles Is that web scale? Doing that. Do what? Web scale? Is that Mongo is web scale? Uh, I believe they would claim so. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's set up for horizontal scaling, basically. Um, so instead of needing to get a bigger, faster, more powerful server to do more data and uh, better performance, you can just spin up a second one and put half your data over there and you're fine. Um, the other thing to think about, which often seems to become the deciding factor, is what's the existing sort of knowledge and tools uh, in your organization or in yourself? Models. Uh, as I understand it, some of the SQL tools are also trying to now take some of the better parts of document model databases and let you do things like store arrays and objects. So, uh, And finally, it's ACID. Uh, Mongo is not strictly ACID compliant. Uh, there are things you can do to make it closer to ACID compliant, but if, uh, if that is a real important thing to your application, maybe not Mongo, or maybe be real careful. We'll talk about that a little more later on as well. So here's a little bit of uh, vocabulary that Mongo uses. Uh, basically, your documents are made up of fields, so that's just a place to store some data. Uh, and that can be pretty much any kind of data type you would want, um, including other objects, binary data. <coughs> there are lots of options. Uh, the document is sort of analogous to a row in SQL. That's your record or the object that you're working with. And then you take a bunch of documents and those, well, you take a bunch of documents of the same kind uh, and those form a collection. Uh, so you can think of that sort of like your table from SQL land. Uh, and finally, you have a database, which is a bunch of collections. Um, I've yet to run into a use case where I really need to run multiple databases inside one application, but I'm sure they're out there. Uh, if we get creative, we could probably dream some up right now. But the ability is there, um, but usually just having multiple collections works great. <coughs> so strictly speaking, uh, these documents, I, I said they were JSON-like. Technically, they are BSON documents. Uh, so BSON is basically JSON. Uh, they added the ability to store a couple of extra things, and they gave it a new name. So JSON. Bison or bison, whatever, uh, however you want to say it, is fine. So uh, I talked a little bit about sort of the flexibility in Mongo and that you can change things around on the fly. Um, there's a lot of things, sort of as you're reading online about Mongo, talking about schema-less databases or databases that have a schema. Uh, officially, the Mongo folks have have this quote on their website saying that. It is not schemaless because the documents are self-subscribing or self-describing, uh, which is basically schemaless. Uh, you know, they say you can store data wherever you want, and because your data is there, you can tell what the schema should have been. Uh, but if you want something like a schema, uh, we, we will get into an document, <coughs> object document model uh, later that lets you sort of add schemas on top of Mongo. Very helpful. So in the end, basically, you do have a whole lot of flexibility. You can store different stuff, but 
if you need to enforce some rules, it's really easy. So let's look at uh, sort of an example of some of this flexible schema business. So this is my uh, imaginary database that we're going to talk about a fair amount today, um, which is a tool inventory, basically storing different kinds of power tools. Uh, as you can see here, all three of these documents have some fields in common, some things different. Uh, everything has a brand, everything has a type, serial number. Um, but some of these tools are cordless, like the first one and the last one, so they have a voltage for their battery. Uh, two of them are also sort of uh, are drills, so they have a size for the chuck that holds whatever you're going to drill with. Um, so these can all be stored in the same collection. They can all be just stored as tools. It doesn't matter that some of them have some fields that the others don't. We want to add some more fields later on. Go for it. Um, so that's one of the advantages and possibly one of the negatives for Mongo, depending on how you look at it. Um, that a lot of folks talk about is that kind of like startup mentality of like let's just let's just start coding something. It's okay that you don't have everything totally figured out. It's okay that you don't know exactly what your data is going to look like or exactly what your requirements are. As you move along, the data can evolve, it can change, and that's fine, uh, which is pretty much true. As long as your application can handle that evolution, the database is totally cool with it. Uh, you just have to watch out that your application is actually also cool with it. Uh, you know, of course, if you're expecting all of your tool documents to have a color field and you added that last week and didn't update any of the older stuff, kaboom. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind as you're working with this. So there is one special field inside Mongo. Uh, every document has an underscore ID. And as you're doing saving documents and adding documents, uh, that's how Mongo knows if something should be replaced or if it's a new thing, uh, basically no two documents in the collection can have the same ID. Um, so you can set it to anything you want. So in our tool example, if serial numbers are just natively unique among all of your tools and you're going to be looking things up by serial number often and you're going to be sorting by that and you just want to use that as your ID, that's fine. You can set it as the ID. If you don't, Mongo does a cool uh, built-in thing where it makes the ID these object IDs, which the ID itself is technically an object. Um, and the object translates to a string that's this hexadecimal that basically guarantees uniqueness inside your database. Um, and as a byproduct, it also puts things in chronological order for you in order of when they were created in the database. Um, it's not totally chronological if you have enough users on different machines and things are syncing <coughs> up across servers, um, but it is very close. Um, so if you're just trying to do a general, like, we're going to show a list of my documents and I want to see the recent stuff first, you can just sort on the ID. And since the ID is indexed by default, everything's pretty happy with that. And you don't have to do anything special. Uh, but there are, <coughs> excuse me, there are cases where it's nice to set it to something else if, like I said, if you already have a unique identifier that you're going to be using a lot. Question. Yes. So if you have a cluster, that ID is generated from the master or something like that, right? I believe that ID is generated on the machine that the document gets added to, and then it gets synced out across. Right. Um, so if you look at the, the makeup there, only the first four bytes is the time, and the rest has to do with uh, who the user is, what process they were using. So even if two two processes on two different machines at a document at the same instant, they still wind up with unique IDs because they're different users and processes. Um, and if the same user on the same process managed to add two things at the same instant, then you get that three byte random string at the end to, again, help you out with uniqueness. <coughs> I could be wrong. There may be a, a central, but I, I think I remember it being on each machine. <coughs> And do feel free to ask questions as we go along. We'll, uh, yeah? These on format that you're talking about, is that something that can be opened up like a JSON or using a picture editor or program? No, it is, uh, it is very much like JSON. Okay. So um, yeah. <coughs> when you're working with it, you will likely not 
think that you're working with anything but JSON. They look the same, they function the same. The only difference is that BSON can hold some extra data types, like binary data, uh, as an official data type. Yes? Uh, it is a standard of sorts. I don't know of anything else that uses it, but it was, um, I believe it was created separately from Mongo. Um, and it's, you know, the people behind it promote it as a standard. Whether or not it's used enough to actually be standard, I'm not sure. <coughs> All right, so uh, here's just a list of uh, sort of the basic operations that you would probably expect from any database. Um, and there's not a whole lot uh, too crazy going on here. You know, you, you've got your insert and your save that both save documents. If you do a save on a document that has an ID that isn't in the collection yet, it basically does an insert. Uh, if you do an insert with an ID and there's already something in the database that has that ID, you just saved over it. Uh, so those two are practically interchangeable. Uh, there are parameters that you can change the upsert uh, to have it function slightly differently. But um, find is your main query, which the query language in Mongo is really nice to work with. Uh, and we'll talk about that in some more detail later. Uh, the update function is basically where you can try to get some acid-like functionality out of uh, Mongo. So the update basically does, uh, takes the same parameters as the find <coughs> for a search, and then it takes parameters for what fields to update and what values to put in there. So it does the query and the update all in one call, and uh, it's basically a transaction there. Um, so what the main thing that you lose from ACID transactions that you might be used to in SQL is that you can't do uh, cross-document Missy, some I always mispronounce that one. The A part of acid. Uh, so basically, if you, if you're trying to update multiple documents, you can't say, okay, well try to update all of these, but if the third one fails, roll back the changes off the first two. Um, the update's going to go update each document as it goes along. Um, and then there's remove, which, as you might guess, removes. <coughs> So let's move on to actually uh, kind of what it's like to work with Mongo. So a couple of tools that I use a lot in working with Mongo. Uh, the first one is RoboMongo, which is this very handy uh, sort of GUI client that lets you mess with your database. And this is RoboMongo. So you can set up connections to different um, Mongo instances. Are we supposed to see that? Oh, you are supposed to see that. Which way is the gear? There's the screen. All right, this is going to be interesting. All right. Uh, so, so basically, right here, I have our imaginary uh, tool database. So my database is called Tool Chest. Inside my database, I have a collection of tool models. And then I can look inside my tool models, and I can see all these instances of the various documents. <coughs> So you asked about working with BSON. You just jump in to edit the document, and it looks just like JSON. Uh, and you can just come in and we decide color is an important thing. Whoop, gotta put it in quotes though. Is the underscore underscore B a special thing also? It is a special thing. Uh, but not a special thing that I've found particularly useful. Uh, there is a kind of versioning that you can get going in Mongo. Um, I have not personally had need to use it, so I haven't really looked into how to get it going. Uh, in general, the databases that I've worked with, the underscore underscore B has stayed zero on almost all of the records. But if you update it, it'll change, won't it? Is that the idea that you would implement so that particular types of changes would increment that? I think that's the general idea, but I don't think it's automatic. I think you okay. do have to somehow tell it what changes are going to increment that. I'll um, try it. 
<laughs> so just saving this should not. Uh, but of course, it also flows that way. So underscore underscore b is still zero. Did give a color of red there, but um, so yes, there is some form of versioning, but um, it's, that's not part of Mongo that I'm. Yeah, they use it in order to like synchronize things where you update it and if it changes, you have multiple things coming at it. Okay. Then you can change it that way. So like if you do the, the update function on that? Yeah, it's like for locking if two people go after something and, uh, you know, I forget myself how okay. to do it, but uh, yeah. Maybe it only does it when you have conflicts? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, no, I, you have to purposely have to change it. I think. That one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> is, is RoboMongo um, uh, available for Windows and for Linux? I don't know. I think it is. I know it's available for, for Linux and Mac. And I think it's available on Windows as well. Yes. We're getting a yes from the Mac. Yes. All right. So that's RoboMongo. We might mess around with that a little bit more later on. Um, but it's very handy just for like, as you're working on your application, you go in and browse through the data and say, oh, you know, there's a query that I need to run just to spot check something. You can run. So you can run any queries you want right up here as well. So if we just decided that we wanted to see all the drills. So it's really good for spot checking things. Um, also, like I showed, you can go in and edit things to fix test data that you messed up as you were developing things. Uh, you can go in and remove documents easily. So pretty handy. Uh, the other tool that I've used quite a bit uh, is Mongoose. So Mongoose is uh, the ODM for using Mongo in Node, uh, which is sort of the stack that I've worked with Mongo. Uh, so it both manages like your connection to the database as well as having some handy wrapper functions that let you do things like the schemas to enforce some rules around what fields should be available in a given collection, what's required, what's not. Um, so this is very handy. MongoDB does produce plugins that you can use directly from Node if you don't want to go through Mongoose. Um, but I think most people use Mongoose. Because <coughs> they did a great job when they made it. Um, and there are similar ODMs available for other platforms. So here's, a, here's an example of what a schema might look like inside Mongoose. Um, so here, you'll notice I am not defining a field for underscore, underscore ID, uh, because I want to let Mongo generate that nice one for me. Um, you know, I'm saying that the date created is true. It's going to default right now, unless you pass in a date when you create this object. Um, I've got a key that I'm also doing a default on just basically to show that you can call any extra function uh, as the default. It doesn't have to be like a built-in date function. Um, and in that case, the key is also sort of a compound type here where it's an array of numbers. <coughs> um, a couple other interesting ones. The, the model name has this uppercase true property. Uh, so no matter what, you, what string you pass in as the model name, it's going to just automatically uppercase it for you before it stores it in the database, uh, which is handy when you need to later query on these strings and you want them all in either upper or lower. Uh, there's also a lowercase true that you can force things lower if you want. Uh, the state requires that you use a string that is one of the values inside this enumeration, uh, which is good when you're doing category type fields. Make sure people don't just go off and invent a new category on you. Uh, 
Yes. <clears throat> so is there any, it seems like there's two things going on there. If you look at model, it seems like you have some validation, like type string or required false. And then you also have some conversion going mm -hmm. on. So is there any way to distinguish those two? Or you just have to, whatever <coughs> it is. <clears throat> Meaning like required, let's say required was true. So if you tried to put something in that didn't have a model name, it would complain, right? Uh, yes, it would. But then uppercase true, it's sort of just converting it to be uppercase. So if you pass <clears throat> something that was lowercase, it's still going to accept that. It's just going to alter it. It's true. Um, so yeah, it is kind of a mix of <laughs> validation and uh, manipulation, I guess. Um, for, yeah, I don't know that there's a great way other than looking at the documentation behind Mongoose to see what these different properties do for you. Um, they make it pretty clear which things are going to sort of apply a rule and throw an error if you don't fit versus It'll just take the value and apply that. Yes? Are these defaults and transformations make sense if you're defining the schema ahead of time? Uh, if you're using the self-describing mm -hmm. document features of MongoDB, do you have any access to that sort of transformation or default value? Uh, no. Okay. So Mongo by itself doesn't care. Right. right? It just says, give me some BSON, I'm going to store it. Write some queries. I'm gonna give you the stuff that makes sense. Oh, so that, that's uh, just Mongoose. Mongoose so yeah. So this is purely like the Mongoose layer sitting on top of Mongo, letting you enforce some rules and do some validation uh, before you get in there. Uh, well, I think I misspoke a little bit. I believe you can enforce some validation rules in Mongo itself, um, but you have to do that like either through their API or Somehow you have to tell it ahead of time, this is the field name and these are, this is kind of the rule for this one. When you set up a uh, collection not, or something like that? I, I think you do it after you've set up the collection. Um, again, I've, my experience with Mongo has all been from the node side and Mongo, Mongoose makes all of this really easy and, uh, and I know a lot of this is on top of the Mongo work, but I do remember, now that I'm thinking about reading some of the documentation that I believe was on Mongo and not Mongoose. It's very easy to confuse which one you read things on. Um, but I believe there is a way to set a validator that's just a straight like, when you save a document to this collection, basically run this function and it'll give a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, so that's not on the central schema though, it's something to do with the collection. That would be stored actually on the database server okay. rather than yeah. in your, so, you may be able to hook in through like that Mongo uh, API and set some of it from your application at startup. Um, and Mongoose does hook into some of the built-in things. So if we look at the next slide where I actually implemented a few of these getters and setters and things, uh, like this schema <coughs> index creation will actually go to your database and create an index on that field. Uh, so Mongoose is interacting with Mongo and changing its configuration for you. Um, so I haven't dug into the nuts and bolts of like, do these schema validation rules also get applied really in the database layer or is it purely in the app layer? Uh, I suspect it's in the app layer because they get enforced basically before you save anything. Uh, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to hit the database first, ask it if it's cool, come back, throw the error <coughs> when the app could do that on its own. So Mongoose isn't just there for setting up the schema and making modification to your metadata. It's like escorting every CRUD operation. Yes. Okay. Yep. So okay. I'm I'm querying and updating and saving through Mongoose and Mongoose talks to Mongo. Now the index is a little different because the index has to be set up on Mongo. Correct. So that's where I was saying that, that there is definitely some interaction between Mongoose and Mongo where when you declare these schemas, it's going to go change at least some of your configuration on the database layer. Um, but I've not dug into all of the, the ins and outs of you know, which operation happens at the database layer, which operation happens at the application layer. Um, in general, my focus has been, did the change happen? Sweet. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes? 
It is, it is not a Mongo concept. Uh, so this, so the schema part of like defining the value, like the types for the fields, you know, saying date created is a date, here's my default, things like that is purely a mongoose thing. Uh, there are other ODM modules out there and I think most of them supply something like this. Uh, mongoose is just sort of the reigning champ in the node world. So that's the one I've worked with. Yeah. So what is Mongoose? Is it a separate process? Is it something that you compile in? Um, Mongoose is, uh, so it's basically a, uh, like an NPM module that you install with your application and then you're calling through hooks in that software. So it's just another package that you're pulling in So I guess briefly, uh, the, uh, these were a few examples of some of the other functionality that you can do with Mongoose. Uh, so this FW setter is a setter function for our firmware, firmware field. Uh, so anytime you save a document with a change to the field firmware, which is the firmware version. So I have that set FW setter. Uh, anytime you change this field, it's going to call this function before it saves, and it's just calling into a helper function to basically store a, a list of what the old values were. Um, sorry, I didn't even set up my hypothetical thing here. So this is sort of like an Internet of Things sort of uh, database application where you've got a group of sensors talking to a central hub. Um, and so then you can also define methods on your model. Uh, so, in your code, when you have an instance of a hub model, you can say hub dot add sensor, and you can just call this function, and you can do anything you want in these method functions. Uh, you know, it's just your standard object-oriented programming that's just sort of an instance function. Uh, you can also set up these virtual fields. So in this case, you can hit hub dot is active and get a Boolean back that's not actually stored directly in the database. Uh, it's calculated based on some of the other fields that are in this model. Uh, and then the one other thing to look at here is this line of the hub schema set to JSON. Um, so in Mongoose, there are two built-in functions, a to object and a to JSON, um, to where you can say, I want you to change this model object, this mongoose thing, into either just a generic object or into a real compliant JSON object. Um, and so this line is saying, when I call to JSON to get the pure JSON, I also want you to put all of these virtual fields in there as if they were real fields. And that's great for when you're like doing a web app and you're doing an API and you want to send JSON representation up to the client for it to display. Uh, a lot of times these virtual fields are going to be things like a nicely formatted date version of what would other, otherwise be an epoch. Um, so those can be very handy. So a little bit about database design. Um, in my experience, it's been best to try and assess first kind of what does my data look like and how am I going to try and access it? How am I going to use it and interact with it before setting up the database itself? Uh, the flexibility in the schemas for Mongo does let you do a lot. You can do the same thing in a lot of different ways, right? So especially when it comes to embedding other objects in documents and sub-documents, um, it's good to think about what makes sense as a separate collection versus what makes sense as child of a parent document. Um, so just a couple of the things to think about is sort of, are you going to always access the data together? Uh, are you sometimes going to be accessing them independent of each other? Uh, and also, how much are these sub-documents going to grow, or arrays especially? Uh, so if you have something where uh, you do a lot of I.O. on your documents, it's important to not have them moving around on the disk too much. Uh, but when you store an object, Mongo sets aside 
a certain amount of storage space for that object, and it gets a little room to grow. Uh, but if you keep adding and keep adding to arrays in the document, as it gets bigger, at some point, it runs out of its allotted space, and Mongo has to pick it up and move it somewhere else. And if it's a really high demand object, that can cause some, some performance drag. Um, so you want to try and avoid that if you can. So here's a real simple example of sort of the, the sub-document question. So imagine we're storing recipes <coughs> in the database. Each recipe has a title, an author, some ingredients with their amounts, the instructions, and then there's a list of comments from other people. <coughs> talking about, oh, this was great, this was awful, needs more salt, what have you. <laughs> um, so the, the way I would suggest to do this, I think the, the title and the instructional text are pretty clear. Those are just going to be strings. Um, the author is maybe a little questionable. You're probably going to have some sort of a user collection or an author collection because the same people will probably write a bunch of different recipes for you. Uh, so you'd probably use a pointer to those. The list of ingredients should almost for sure be a sub-document. Um, you know, that's going to be, what is the ingredient? How much of this one? That piece of information makes no sense outside the context of your recipe. Also, your recipe is pretty useless without it. They're always going to be together, group them together. Uh, and the comments, you could embed if you have a very small user base and you don't think they're going to comment much, but uh, we've all seen internet com comment sections. It may grow boundlessly uh, and often needlessly. So uh, you probably want to make that a pointer to outside sub-documents. They fill the or actually, space. You'd probably want to go the other direction. You would probably want a comments collection that points back to the recipe that comment applies to. Yes. It fills the available space very nicely. It, it could, yes. Yeah. <laughs> is there a pointer concept in the Mongo database itself, or is, are you superimposing a uh, Mongoose is doing a fair amount of superimposing there. Uh, you can certainly store IDs as values in Mongo, and that's really what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, so whether that be a string that you're using as your ID, or if it's one of those object IDs that Mongo created, uh, you can store that in a field, and Mongo's fine with it, and you can, you know, with no mongoose, you're just working directly. You could store that, you could look it up, and then you could do another, a second query for find by ID, this ID, and go get your thing, uh, and sort of hydrate it on your own. Mongoose does have a concept of, uh, in the model, they all have a function called populate, and populate basically says, go do all that for me. Uh, so you can query, and in this case, you could go get your recipe, and then you could say, all right, well, now I want the comments that go along with this, and I want the author, so recipe.populate, and it'll go hit Mongo and pull all of that in for you and expand out your model object. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty slick. That said, it's, uh, you know, that is sort of additional queries, so if you're... <coughs> If performance and sort of throughput is the main paramount concern, then populate might be a little expensive in that case because uh, you're going to do multiple queries. But for for the apps that I've worked with, it's it's great. Yes. So do you get to control the indexing of those what I would call foreign keys on other documents then, or is it not necessary? Uh, so all of your IDs are going to be indexed by right. default. Uh, and you can set up <coughs> either directly in the database or if you're using Mongoose. Right, but when you're doing this populate, you're going to be looking for the ID of the business and real ID, mm -hmm. which, which is that index automatic ID in other tables where it's not going to be that ID pool, right? Oh, so as part of, uh, let's see, did I do one here? I thought I had an example. Um, so in the schema, you tell it which table. It belongs to essentially. Yeah. Uh, so in, uh, history down there, don't you have ID colon false? Uh, that one's a little different because here I'm storing an array of objects in the the history, and so by default, when you put an object inside an array in Mongo, it tries to give that an underscore underscore ID as well because it treats that as a sub document. Uh, so that little ID false says. Hey, these aren't really documents. This is just an array of objects that have these two fields. So, skip that for me. 
So the same with the bottom sensors, ID. Under hey, ID. that is, there's what we're looking for. So this ref sensor model says, hey, this is storing an underscore ID that's a string, because in this case, the sensors really did have their own unique identifier uh, oh. that was used as the ID. Their IDs were always uppercase. I'm saying, this is a reference to the sensor model. So if I call hub.populate, it'll bring in a full sensor model to each index of the sensors array. So there's your relational uh, to the to the other document yep. collection. That's it. Cool. So uh, so queries. This is, uh, I think, one of the uh, nicer parts of Mongo. It gives you lots of ways that you can access your data uh, and that you can write your queries. Uh, so just a, a couple examples. So the most basic is you're calling a dot find and you're passing an object and saying, just give me everything that matches this object. Uh, I got a little fancy here by using this greater than operator here. Uh, any place in one of these queries that you see a dollar sign, it's like a function inside Mongo. Uh, and this is no longer Mongoose stuff. This is straight up just Mongo. Uh, so here we're saying, Find me all of the tools that have a brand of default, a type of drill, and a chuck size that's greater than 0.5. Um, you can also do sorts and limits and skips. It makes pagination super easy uh, if you're doing a web app sort of thing. Um, you can do, or you can also do explicit and logic. Uh, by default, everything's and logic, so I haven't really found a case where I needed to use dollar and there if you want to be very explicit about uh, you know, what the operator is between your different pieces of your query. But here we're saying uh, find me anything that's either a brand of DeWalt or a brand of Milwaukee or a type of table saw. Uh, so as you see there, even inside the OR, like, you can hit different fields, you can hit the same field multiple times, whatever you'd like to do. Um, and then you can also check on the existence of a field. So that's looking to see if the field is even named in the document. You can also do a uh, dollar is null, I believe, to check for explicit null sets. Uh, there's also like an is empty. So there, there are lots of variations depending on how you're storing your data. Is there a question over there? Yes. This is a concept of data types. Like in integer code. Uh, there's not much concept of the data type in sort of Mongo's core, right? Mongo doesn't really care in the document. Uh, when you're working with an ODM on top of it, then there definitely is. Uh, in so, Mongoose, you can define it. So in Mongoose, you definitely can define that. Um, but you can also still use Mongoose and not define it if you want to. You can just say, well, this is a field named data. I'm going to stuff stuff in it. So when you're dealing with integers, like um, in your tools, models, uh, collection, the first query mm -hmm. greater than 0.5, it knows, Mongo needs to know that that's, uh, that's got to be an um, integer. Because if you still are a string in there, uh, what's it going to do? I forget um, myself. I, no, I, I, I believe uh, I believe if you do a greater than oh, it's on be strings, a... it does alphabetical sorting right. and says, you know, does this basically does the ASCII value of this mm -hmm. wind up being greater than what you passed in? Um, so you can do that for you know, if you have a name field and you want everybody with names that start after M, you could do. Greater than but if you had a chuck size and for some someone inserted something in, into the chuck size that was a string, not a 0.5, um, and then you hit it with a greater than 0.5 with that. Yeah, I'm not sure if you would get the bad data in that case or not. It's not going to blow anything up, no. but I don't know if it will be included in your result. When you um, defined it in the, in the schema, did you say it was an integer? Uh, I didn't actually show the schema oh, okay. for, the, for the tool file. But I would have, uh, well, I wouldn't have called it an integer because in this case it's a, a point 0.5. In Mongoose, it's not really integer anyway, it's just number. So it's like string, number, date, object, array. Um, 
but yes, I would define that as a number if I were making this for real. Uh, so, Mahu can uh, do the partial queries as in for the brand, if I give only D, W, can it give me the result with the revolve? Can it, does, does the, can it do the contains query where the string contains it? Or? You can do a dollar regex and do regular expressions inside your queries. Uh, you can also do, I think it's dollar contains. Uh, I think there are a few other. There's, There's many, many strings. operators inside yeah. this query language. Um, so you definitely can do, does this string start with this? Uh, just by default saying brand DEW, it's only going to look for an exact match. But uh, there are tools for doing that kind of query. And then there are tools for even other crazier, more advanced things, uh, which Mongo calls aggregation. And uh, so these are, are not the most common queries you're going to do. But when you run into a case where you need to do something uh, more involved in a single query, uh, you can do really cool things here. <laughs> uh, so there are a few, a few options for different kind of aggregations. Uh, the first one they call the aggregation pipeline. Uh, so it lets you just stack up a bunch of different stages of your query. You can manipulate the data in the middle of this and then do more querying on top of the results of that. Uh, you can get really crazy if you want to. Uh, here's sort of a, a simple-ish version that the Mongo folks came up. Uh, so in this case, they're saying, let's look at this orders data orders collection, uh, and first we're going to look for all of the orders that have a status of A, and then we're going to group those by the customer ID and total up how much that order was for. Uh, so in a, in the single query action, you wind up basically just compiling all of your data down into this one array of results. Uh, here's a out of my notes here. Got another uh, little example I put together for my tool database here. <coughs> All right, so I'm just going to walk you through this query before I run it here. Um, And the, the command line thing that you have had over there, is that your user preference or do you also have some sort of a more graphical search kind of a feature in the tool? Uh, in this tool, you basically have the command line sorts of arguments to run queries, and then the, the graphical part more comes into play with sort of browsing through those results. Uh, expand and collapse things, and you can look at them in table format, and sort of the raw BSON, sure. you can step through the results here. It's returning 50 at a time by default, but you can change okay. the limit there and page through it. Doesn't have a assist for doing a query building, does it? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Like building those aggregates are a pain. It, it can be a pain, that is true. Uh, so in this case, my match is battery volts exists true. So I'm looking for all of the cordless tools in this, uh, in this collection. And then I'm grouping them by the unique combination of the brand and the number of volts. So basically, I'm saying, hey, I've got all of these tools. A bunch of them are cordless. In one brand and voltage, they're interchangeable. So how many batteries of each kind do I need to have around in order to get these uh, running? So this last part, I'm going to total, basically add one to the total for each of these that match. So I'll run that. And, uh, and there are 50,000 tools in my database. So you can see how, uh, how speedy that was. Uh, not that 50,000 is, is like the ceiling that you might hit, but I didn't want to push my vagrant machine uh, too hard here tonight. <laughs> so I got back. There are 15 combinations of brand and voltage, you know, basically. I've got 15 kinds of batteries. You know, there's 1,270 of those, 1,246 of Ryobi's 18 volt. So you can do a lot of uh, 
sort of powerful queries there with the aggregate pipeline. How does the, uh, the aggregation pipeline play with like uh, the mongoose populate function? Like, say you're going to pop you need to pop those XML IDs. Um, I, I have not tried to do the two together. I suspect they don't play real nice because what you get back from the aggregate pipeline is generally not a document that fits the same schema. Uh, and as you just saw, like, my results from that query was a single document that had an array of 15 sub-documents that then had these other fields. Um, every time I've used an aggregate pipeline, we run some sort of a specific pipeline query and then manipulate that document kind of by hand before doing, you know, returning it to the user or doing whatever with it. Um, so I think if one of the things you returned was one of those object references, you would probably have to populate that manually. Um, I don't know. Mongoose may have a cool way to work around that, but since it's not going to cleanly fit in your original schema Mongoose model, like maybe you could build another schema that defines what the result of that thing should look like and tell it how to populate. That's a good question. Yes? Do you ever uh, write C4 or C++ 